Yo, GDR here in beautiful Jamaica with some more answers to your questions. The first question, thank you by the way for your questions, I love them. First one is, will you please explain the quote, the surest way to hurt someone you like is to put all of your trust in him. Can you please explain that? Well, if, if I said it, I'd probably need to explain it because that is not my character to say such a thing, but it is the character of Carla. Two reasons. One, Carla's a cynic. She's, remember, she's, Carla is the one who says, happiness is a myth. It was invented to make us buy things. That's Carla. It's bitter, it's cynical, the world is like that. Remember who Carla is as a character. The second thing about her is that if she puts all of her trust in someone, all of her trust, she will be divulging to that person that she murdered someone, the person who raped her. And that puts that person at risk if she divulges everything. Then that person is, whether they like it or not, an accomplice in her uh, fugitive flight from justice. And so on, because that person could pick up a phone and say, there's a fugitive here who needs to return to justice. So she has those two sides to her, a cynical side that's going to come out with a, um, a quick, sort of bitter, um, or an, a, a remark that's right on the edge of bitter. She's not bitter herself, but she's cynical. The other side of her is that if she divulges, she's going to be in that. So for her to say, you know what, the surest way to hurt someone you like is to put all of your trust in him. She's trying to warn Lynn that that's not something I can do without compromising you. So that's the explanation of that line. It brings us to another question from readers, which is about the conversation with Carter by. And that's, there's a relation here. The conversation's about complexity and about God and this and that that Carter by has with Lynn. People ask, well, is this your philosophy and so on? No, it's not. It's Carter by's philosophy. He's a character. When I created the character of Kadabai, and no, he's not a real person, there was no Kadabai, and that's an answer to another uh, perennial question. And of course, if there's no, if there's no Kadabai, there's no sword that Kadabai could have left to me. The skill of a writer is in, for a very brief time, that someone in your world to believe there was a sword. And as fiction, that's what writers do, create. A movie does the same thing. It makes you believe this can happen, and so on, in a film. So. When you have a character like Karubai and you're creating a character like him, I wanted him to be a Don, but I wanted him to be not like the Dons I'd met, who were not but profound thinkers. I wanted him to be um, a wise person, but I wanted him to be so uh, filled with his own sense of his wisdom that, that he would pronounce on things and so forth and ultimately march into a very perilous situation through the same kind of pride and almost arrogance that he has. So. This is in character for Kadurbai. When I created him, I created a way of thinking and I took an element of my own, you know, philo philosophy, for want of a better word, I took an element of that and gave it to the character. And then I let that character run with it. And what he says is not necessarily what I say. An extension of that is the character Idris, who is in The Mountain Shadow. And he's a sage who's constantly pronouncing things and say, there's pages of him pronouncing his things. Do I believe those things? Some of them, but not all of them. Idris believes them. Do I believe that happiness is a myth and that it was invented to make people buy things? No, but Carla believes that. She's my character. And my character has to have her own independent set of beliefs. More than that, as a writer, I think if you put your politics, we all have politics, we all have philosophies. If you put that into your creative art, you can put it into your autobiography, you can put it into your essays and other things, and it needs to be there. But if you put it into your fiction, it should really be something that the characters can have. You give a character a piece of this, give a character a piece of that, let them run with it in their way, speak in their own way, think about that subject in their own way, let them develop that. And otherwise you tend to be lecturing people and you know, it becomes polemical, it becomes a kind of um, philosophical argument that's really the book is just, um, if you like, the Trojan, it's the horse, and I really want my philosophical argument in there, and so on. Much better to let your characters argue a point here or there, and it's very important to have, let characters disagree with you. Say things and do things that you would not and could not say, so to speak. They're just not part of your natural character, but they are for that character, and so you might find a character who says repugnant things to other people, but that is that character. And we've all known people in life who 
are pretty hard when they're speaking to other people, you can let that character live as that way. And if you try to control that character and contour that character's speech so that it more accurately reflects the way you are and the way you want the world to be, it's a polemic. And that character closes up in a little cocoon until you give that freedom again to say, all right, all right, say what you want as a character. If it goes over the bounds, I'm going to cut that off. I'm letting you know, but say what you want. Let your character run free. And they go, okay. And then that character will start saying things, and you go, damn, where did that come from? It didn't come from you. It came from allowing the character to be real. So in answer to those questions, no, they're not necessarily my philosophies, although I have some ideas about complexity and complexification. These are the philosophies and ideas of Cardiby, a created character. And that's, I think, part of writing art. So I hope that answers that question. Associated with that, a third question I'd like to deal with, and I hope I'm not keeping you guys too long, is that associated with that, one reader in talking about Karabai and these discussions said, asked a really profound question. You all, I mean, it's not as though, hey, all these questions are not profound and this one is. And so I'm not saying that, but it's every now and then a question comes through that just rings a bell because of its depth. It's, it's difficult to answer or it's easy to answer, but it goes really deep. And that question was, when did you first experience God on your spiritual path, experientially? When did you first know God experientially rather than conceptually? It's a terrific question. That is, when does it change from being an idea to a reality in your life, an experienced reality? For me, God is too big. I don't know God. I don't know anything about God. I, I think if we have a concept, but uh, of something that is beyond all and created all. But for whatever reasons, the infinite creativity, no doubt. But I think this is so big that it's way too big for me, so to speak. I focus on connecting with the spiritual, which I think is, if you like, the DNA handprint of the divine in everything and that spiritual nature that we can connect with. <clears throat> so, for me, the first profound experience, and I think all of us have multiple experiences in our lives with the spiritual, and they're actually sometimes really profound and we don't know it, until later we think back and go, oh my God, I met that person on that date, that was a turning point, and I, I never realized it until now, what that person said, had echoes and reverberations in my life, and I'm different from what that person said or did on that day. So they can happen like that too. But when it's a conscious moment of stepping outside yourself into something that you don't understand, but you know it's beyond this, that happened to me, in answer to your question, the first time I blew the conch. I'd watched it being blown and had lots of spiritual experience, you know, hair standing up and goosebumps and it really put a buzz and a vibe that was undeniable. But the first time I blew the conch myself after preparing for it, that changed everything. Big love from Jamaica. Hope those answers are good for you. Blessings and love. <laughs>